Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Um, those of you at home, I'm here, Um Yeah, this is this is a word that I believe um, you know God was talking to me, and he and he says, you know, this is a message I have. It's really important, and I don't think even you can muck it up. So. And so thanks, Bruce, for doing that, because I was thinking, well, okay, well, even if I get it right, people might be sitting there and not be listening, but that was awesome. All right, are you ready to receive the word? Yes. Can we have uh, the... Okay. So I'm entitled what I'm going to talk about today is the World War. A biblical guide to surviving the end times, and um, I don't know if you've noticed in the last couple of years we, we've had a global pen, pandemic, pandemic, coronavirus. Um, with and you know people have been starting to think, well, you know the Bible talks about you know diseases and 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 those sorts of things. Um, more recently, we've, as part of that, and, and this is not what I'm preaching about, I'm just going to mention it, um, the mandating of vaccines and people losing their jobs, and it doesn't matter which side of the argument, both, both have strong points to them. What I'm trying to say is people looking at that and going, well, hang on, is, is that what is spoken about in Revelation? Is that the, the mark of the beast where you lose your job because of something your government tells you to do? And then more recently, or the last few weeks, when Russia invaded Ukraine, and those of you who with a sort of an eye on biblical prophecy were going, oh, hang on, because we all know that Russia is tied to Gog, you know, the, that um, the ancient uh, person and the land of Magog, and it's a person from the north that's going to come down. It's like, is this the end of the end times? Is, this, is it going to happen? And, uh, and I started thinking about this, like, well, what does God say? And so I went to the book of Revelation, and um, the message that God has for the church is surprised, may be surprising. And I want to share it um, quickly with you. And uh, but before we jump into Revelation, it's a little, maybe a little bit arrogant of me to say that you know probably the most contested and difficult and complex book of the entire Bible I'm going to cover in half an hour um, so clearly I'm not and I'm, and there will be questions I will leave unanswered and there will be arguments that um, I won't make I'm going to assume some things and drive through it but there's a message for us and there was a message for the original audience um, oh yeah that's right I've got this now now I'm going to work it wow First thing, we are in the end times. There's some things that we've got to state from the beginning. Jesus is going to come back. That is definite, right? When he comes back, he will be visible. It will be phys uh, physical. Uh, it will be triumphant. It will be glorious. Jesus is going to come back, and it will be soon. We just don't know the time, okay? That's the indefinite part of it. In fact, Jesus said, don't even worry about the. When did the end time start? It started at the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are we in the end times now? Yes, we are. So, a, a couple of words about um, interpreting Revelation. It's not a secret predictive code um, in terms of, oh, yeah, if this happens, then they'll do, oh, we can tell it's going to be in 1988. <laughs> no, because someone actually said that, and it, it's gone, right? It's not a predictive code about trying to work out. It's about us getting ready for the return of Jesus. It's not a timeline or even a chrono chronology. Um, some of the events in Revelations, you've got the seven seals and the seven bowls and the seven trumpets. They are different versions of the same thing. They're not like setting out. A, it's not setting out a chronology. Um, it's not something you can take to the latest news item 
and you know, with Ukraine being the most recent, and go, well, how does Revelation fit into this news item, right? We can't take current events and try and fit them into the Bible. We've got to let the Bible speak to us. And much of it is not literal. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, actually, the slide after the next slide. Um, it's symbolic, so I will get to there. I actually like this picture, um, the Great Tribulation. We are in, you know, tribulation means affliction, severe hardship. The world has been in that. And I love this picture because that guy, like, I was, I was trying to think, what would be a good um, caption for this dude? It's like, oh, yeah, I'd like some pizza or my pepperoni, please. You know, in the meantime, look what's happening behind him. <laughs> and we've been a little bit like that, haven't we? We're just... There's been tremendous hardship, famines, pestilence, wars, rumors of wars. For the last 2,000 years, and well, little old New Zealand has been a little bit isolated from that up until coronavirus came. But well, the rest of the world has been doing it hard, and Christians have been doing it hard. Okay, he's got a gun, which makes it sort of a little bit different. Okay. Revelation of Jesus Christ. The book is not about revelations. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ, of who he is and what he did, how he overcame death and the enemy, and went, and also his coming, his soon imminent return. Oops. Getting so excited. I mean, and, and, it, and it talks lots about Jesus, and I can't give everything it talks about Jesus, but he, he's the rule of the kings of the, of the earth. It talks about him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. The glorious Jesus who sits at the right hand of God, and he's coming back with the clouds. So it has that revelation of who he is, but there's a surprising revelation that surprised particularly Jewish, the Jewish audience, that he's the slain lamb. And the slain lamb is what assures the victory or what achieves the victory. We'll get back to that a little bit later. And it's important for us to know because how he conquered is how we are going to conquer. Uh, second, it's a letter um, anchored in its historical context. It was to people who were being persecuted or had just been persecuted by Nero. And if you, you know, if you're one of those clever people, the, um, the number of 666 and the, the, he, the Hebrew language, the letters also related to numbers. Um, Neron Caesar is 666, okay? Of course, the reason why you have apocalyptic literature is so you can hide some things from those who are persecuting. Also, the name beast is, uh, adds up to 666. So we might come back to that a little bit later. They were going through tribula tribulation. They were persecuted. They had known people who had died for being a Christian. And that was with Nero. Nero had, had gone. And now the new emperor, Domitian, um, he was showing the same things, and so it looks like they are going to be persecuted again. So it's a letter to these uh, seven churches, and certainly the chapters 1 to 3, the letters to the churches are to real churches and real people who have real-life problems. So you can't, must remember that. It's an ap apocalyptic prophetic book. Ap apocalyptic literature um, I mean, it starts in Daniel and Ezekiel, and it's got these big sort of, this imagery, but it all means something. And it's in that, um, the book of Revelation follows that genre. It's completely understandable. All you need to know is the Old Testament. You don't need to be some super spiritual person with a connection to, to you know, to the Holy Spirit you just need to know the Holy... I mean, you still need the Holy Spirit to help you interpret it. But you just need to know the Old Testament, right? They, they seem way out, but they're not really. Um, as I said, numbers mean something. The, word, the number seven is, stands for completeness, and it's right through Revelation. 
I would go so far as say the, um, the number of thousand is also symbolic for those millennialists amongst us. But I'm not going there today. And certainly Revelation brings the Old Testament prophecy to its climax. And um, it's, it's not about, so you, you know, we, we are thinking about the Ukraine war at the moment. It's not about individual wars or between this nation or that nation. There's a cosmic spiritual battle that started in Revelation 3, verse 15, between the, the snake and the son of man, right? And Revelation is the climax of that. And we are part of that battle, and we'll, we'll hear about that a little bit. Okay, now I've sort of got that off my chest. How, this is how I see Revelation. I have four messages for you from Revelation. The first one is, select your side. I'm not sure if you can read that. Can you? Yep. And I put up, just to make it a little bit clearer, this is the side that you get to select. It sounds easy, but wait. You can, you can choose victory with Jesus or defeat with Satan. Sounds like an easy choice, doesn't it? Good, but if it was easy, we would have a lot more people here, right? Select your side. First thing you need to know is you're already a combatant. You're already a participant in this world war, in this cosmic war. Because how you live your life de determines which side you're on. Right? You don't get a choice to be neutral. You can't be Switzerland or Finland and say, hey, that's right, that's for you guys. In the cosmic war, you make a choice in your life, and that's the side you're on. And you either choose ultimate victory with Christ, with Jesus, or you choose defeat with Satan. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, look, you can't serve two masters. You're either going to hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. There's no middle ground. You cannot sit on the fence in this war. How you live your life is making a, dis uh, is making a choice. And you know what? In Revelation itself, Jesus says that he hates people that sit on the fence. He, he wrote to the church of Laodicea and said, I know your deeds and that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were one of the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. We need to make a choice. You need to, in your mind, make a choice. And maybe there's someone here or someone online, and you're listening to this, and you've never made a conscious decision to choose Jesus. And I want to say, select your side now. You need to be ready because we don't know the day or hour. There's no reason why it couldn't be today or tomorrow. And Jesus is coming. We know that. Revelation breaks down, breaks down the choice. We either A, resist Babylon and follow the lamb or follow the beast and suffer defeat. And when it uses the words Babylon and beast, um, John, who's the writer, he, he uses them as an archetype. He's not talking about the actual city Babylon, but an archetype of humanity's rebellion against God. Every human economic or military power or kingdom eventually becomes Babylon, which is human rebellion against God. Just in case you've never heard of Satan, the Bible says he's like a thief that comes to kill steal and destroy and it's not a side you want to be on now I mentioned uh, before that it's not an easy choice because if I had to summarize revelation in one sentence it would be it would be something like it's going to get worse before it gets better okay it's going to get worse before it gets better two Second message for you. We need to conquer like Christ. And it's just awesome. Listen, you know, like we sing so many prophetic songs here, right? We sing about the victory, the victory of Christ and how we can be, be victors. We are more than conquerors. We know that. Um, Paul said that in, um, in Romans. Um, and, he, and oh, no, hang on, I'll come back to that. 
Revelations 12, 11. They triumphed over him, and him being the accuser, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Actually, Revelation is a very disturbing book. It's a very challenging book, and yet it has so much hope for us. It's probably challenging for us in New Zealand because some of the things that those churches um, were um, told off for, for being apathetic, for being lukewarm, for being affluent and comfortable and um, denying Christ, isn't that us? I mean, like, I want to ask you, is that us? Is that you? And so if you are wanting to select the side of Jesus, and if you're wanting to follow um, Jesus, we are called to conquer the same way he won the victory. How did he win the victory? How did Jesus win the victory? On the cross. He, He won the victory on the cross. How are we going to win the victory? Same way. Revelations um, gives two really interesting things. These, these um, stand out for me, and so I'm going to go into a little bit of detail. Revelation 4, 5. There's a picture of the glory of God in heaven, and there's the scroll. And it has the message of how God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven, which is, which is awesome because, you know, even the, the, the prayer that Jesus taught us is talking about the end times. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And John weeps because there's no one who can open the scroll. And and the the cry goes out, who is found worthy to open the scroll? And there was no one. And so like he cries. And then this angel comes along and says, wait, there is someone who's worthy. And then it gives the names of Jesus. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's the root of David, right? The great coming king. And these are military titles. And that's what John hears. And then he sees, and he sees something completely different. Well, not completely different. He sees something different and surprising. And he sees a lamb that's been slain. So he's the lion of the tribe of Judah and the the root of David. And he looks and he sees a lamb that's been slain. And that is how Jesus won the victory. Not through the great, that'll come. Not through the great military might or power. He came by giving his life. uh, Just as the original lamb in Passover was killed and it saved all of the people of God in Israel in in Exodus. And so God's kingdom reign started with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it started. It hasn't come in fully. That's another preach in your eschatology. It's here. It's not fully realized. Not yet. You know, just push the wrong button. All right. A little bit later on in, um, in chapter 7, the same thing happens again, but it's not so much about Jesus. Uh, there's another question, and it's uh, talking about the day of the Lord, which is the sixth seal. Who can stand in the day of the Lord where these tremendously tragic events and um, terrible things happen. Who can stand? And uh, John, again, he hears uh, the number of 144,000. It's 12,000 from each of the tribes, and it goes through all of those. And that's a military census. This is the army of the Lord, the great army of the Lord. That's what he hears. But what he sees is something different. He sees the lamb that was slain leading people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue. And they were the great army of the Lord. We are the great army of the Lord. But we led by the lamb that was slain. And what I want to say is we must conquer like he conquered. We will conquer how he conquered. And I'll talk about that in a second. Oh, except to give Paul that scripture I was mentioning before. Romans 8, 36. It is written, for your sake we face death all, long, uh, all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And then he says in 37, no, 
In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Even Paul is tying the fact that our victory and our being conquerors and winning in Christ, amen, is about laying our lives down. There is a disturbing message in Revelation. It's a call to martyrdom. And, I, and while I'm thinking of it, I don't know if you saw um, you know, the, the people in Ukraine and uh, on the news, and they says, um, in their Ukrainian accent, which I won't do well, um, this is my country, this is my land. I'm going to fight for it. If I die, oh well. Like, what would it take for us to have that sort of framework in our mind? It's like, I love something so much that I'm willing to give my life. And it's not just men, it was women as well. All right? I'm, this is not a pro-Ukrainian or pro-Russian talk. I'm just saying it's, it's inspiring as I've been watching these events happen about what it takes for someone to get, lay down their life for something that's more important than themselves. And that's what we are called to. That's what you are called to. Except our fight is through loving sacrifice. Showing the mercy of God. That's a picture from um, Ukraine. But again, I'm talking about the cosmic war. You know... um, you know, martyrdom isn't something that's unknown in the church. In fact, there's more martyrs in these years than there ever has been in the history of the church. They're just not happening in New Zealand. We have a little bit of pressure. There's a little bit of pressure that causes us to deny Jesus, but not like there is in like Nigeria, I think. Is, there's more Christians that die in Nigeria than any other country. Surprisingly, There was a, um, um, there's a saying that you may have heard, the blood of the martyrs is the, is the seed of the church, or the church grows on the blood of the martyrs. This is where it came from. Um, it's a Latin that's been translated in, in, into English, so just take a second to read it. I'm not calling you to, to die now. I'm calling to settle it in your mind that Jesus is the more important than your life. So when you select your side and when you go out to conquer with Christ, you know what you're signing up for. Let's go back to there. Serve and suffering. Revelation 6. So I've got sticky, I have to do this, I've got sticky fingers. <laughs> and every time I, um... all right. Revelation 6, we're to bear witness to God's justice and mercy through the word of our testimony and love our enemies. How do, so how, how do we serve? How do we conquer? Showing God's justice and mercy to the people around us. Living our testimony, loving our enemies. Um, I, I just love, I sort of heard a couple of um, people, I think we're going to do this at our, at our church, where those people who have been uh, affected by COVID, we're going to give them um, packs and express our love that way. That's how we conquer. It's through love. Um, we're to pray. And Revelation 19 talks about the prayers of the saints. This and when the full amount of the prayers of the saints come in, he's going to come. And we're to worship Revelation 7, 14. We're not to be caught up with immoral acts. Um, this is what the churches were told off for. Sin, take it out of your life and do righteous acts. Through your actions... People will know who you are. When I was um, <clears throat> a teenager, this was a, a, a poem that I came across. And it quite, 
affected my life. Um, I first read it, I think it was in February 1984, and I became a Christian about a week later. And so I give it to you. It's a metaphor for what we are called to as a Christian. And, and, and may I say that our church vision calls us to this. We want everyone to be passionate about Jesus and to transform your communities. And this is the type of Christianity that we are wanting you to have and we are expecting of ourselves and something I believe is consistent with the Bible and particularly here in Revelation. Message number four. So what have you had? Select your side. Conquer with Christ. Serve with suffering. And I said it was going to get worse before it gets better, but it gets better. Receive the award. Because throughout Revelation, God is in control. There's no time in Revelation do you think, wow, God doesn't even know what he's doing. It turns out that he's the only one that knows what he's doing. Even the, uh, Jesus said, even the Son of Man doesn't know the hour or the time. He hasn't, God hasn't sh shared that with him. God is in control. He is our transcendent God. And when I say it's a fight between Satan and God, Satan isn't even a picture, uh, isn't even in the picture. Jesus promised that he is going to return, and when he returns, evil will not go unpunished. He will return as king. He came as the lamb that was slain, but he will return as the king. To remove evil and vindicate his followers. Books will be opened. And anyone whose name was not in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. That's a direct quote. And in Revelation 20.21 20, particularly, but 21.5, write this down. Behold, I am making all things new. So go back to Genesis. There was the Garden of Eden, and the garden was lost because of sin. And in Revelation, he says, I'm going to make a new Garden of Eden. I'm going to make a new heaven and earth. There's a new Jerusalem. And we are the bride of the Lamb that's spotless and pure, and all creation becomes the temple of God and the Lamb. And we don't need a temple because God is amongst us, the presence of God. And that's what we call to. That is what our hope is in Jesus. And that's what makes it worth anything that we have to follow him now. Because to lay down your life for Jesus, you will not lose it. You will gain eternal life. And these are the messages in Revelations. Jim Elliot, uh, the older people will know them. Sorry, I'm an old person preaching. So I have all these references. Um, Jim Elliot was a missionary in the 60s -ish. American guy and uh, America had got to a stage where they'd had missionaries for you know hundreds of years and, and um, in the 1700s and 1800s and so on missionaries had died but there hadn't been people who had died as a missionary for many 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 years and it was felt that you know being a Christian was quite a comfortable thing but um, Jim Elliot and his mates, they had this heart 
for this tribe in uh, Amazon that had never had heard the gospel called the Auka, A-U-C-A, I think it is, tribe. They were a particularly violent tribe and tended to protect their territory and would kill anyone who came along there. But they had this heart, like, these people need to hear the gospel. And so they started and they flew in and they... Um, had this you know, strategy, they would give them packs of food and they would you know, try and reach them and, and this went on for quite a while. Um, but then one day, um, they were killed. And uh, they didn't find, about, find out this until afterwards, but they'd been, they'd been speared and massacred. And his wife, um, looking in his diary, had seen that he'd written this um, some time before. And he'd made this decision. This is how he decide, um, came up with the, framed the decision in his mind. He is no fool. I know you've read, you've read it, but let's think about it again. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. She is no fool either. It's not foolish to give up what you cannot keep to gain what you cannot lose. Choosing Jesus is not an easy choice. I know it seemed easy on slide number one. But by the time we get to slide number four or five, it's not an easy choice. It's not an easy choice. And if you think it's too hard for you, then don't. But why would you give up your life? Why would you give up what you cannot afford to lose? Matthew 7.13, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So what must we do? I want to say, this is what Jesus was saying to us. Make sure you've selected your side, right? And you've told people, this is the side I'm on, right? If you haven't selected a side, that selection or decision is made for you, right? If you don't choose to follow Jesus, then you're not following Jesus. You can't have a foot in each camp. You can't sit on the fence. You can't come to church on Sunday and deny Jesus other days. Number two, decide to imitate the life of Jesus. Is your faith half-hearted? Are you apathetic to those around you? Are you compromised in sin? Get right with God. One thing I haven't said that I did want to say, God loves you. God loves you so much. He's not just the big God that comes down. He's been involved with your life and he wants the best for you. Number three, are you serving in suffering? I know at the moment you're suffering in silence because I'm going on. Are you serving in suffering? Are you choosing that comfortable style of Christianity? Are you a pew warmer? Do you seek Jesus every day? Are you passionate about Jesus? And do you seek to transform your communities? It won't be easy. Do you need to know that one day you'll be vindicated? Doesn't vindicated, vindicated. You're going to receive your reward. You will. You will receive your reward. Be faithful because you are going to receive a reward and you will hear the voice, well done, my good and faithful servant. It's going to happen. It's worth it. History has a conclusion and that conclusion is determined by the God we serve. So make a decision. Make the right decision. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'm going to pray, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to make sure in your mind, it doesn't matter how many years you've been a Christian, right? Make sure you're in your mind 
and you know which side you're fighting, and you know how you're going to live your life. If you're here or you're online and you haven't given your life to Jesus, I want you to make that decision. It's not something... um, uh, if you actually, if you want to come up and you want to make make that decision, come up because people need to see it. Right? This is not secret Christians. Father God, you are a transcendent, loving, merciful, just God. We know that when Jesus died and rose again. He won a victory that cannot be undone. We want to follow Jesus and want to be known as followers of Jesus. We commit our life to Him that we might be called in the army of God from every tribe and nation and language. No matter the cost, we give our life to you. We are a people of faith and not of fear. We are people who transform others through love and mercy and acts of love and mercy. And if this is you and you want prayer and you want to come up and make sure that your decision is seen before other people, come up to the front. If you're at home and you're sitting there and going, yeah, no, I want to make that decision. Well, you get on your knees where you are and you cry it to God and say, God, I'm yours. I select you and I will live my life how Jesus lived his life, no matter the cost. Because I know that there is a day coming when Jesus is going to return and I want my life, my name to be in the book of life and my life to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus. Amen. I want you to think about this. Maybe go to Revelation, have a read. Hear what the Spirit is saying. I'm going to hand over to Bruce. Now, just to, um, just to finish this up, thank you very much.